Majestar, Majesty, is the name that designates the enthroned Madonna, represented as the Queen of Heaven, and three are present in this hall, one by Cimabue, one by Duccio di Boninsegna, and one by Giotto, painted a few years apart from each other. We will always compare this Maya star with the other two that have a similar shape and subject. So it will be easier to understand the differences between a style that is still Byzantine in part, as in the others, and the completely new style of which Giotto is a master. In Florence, Giotto's Meister was located in the Church of Honor Santi, All Saints, hence the name. It was commissioned by the important community of the Umiliati, who had established themselves in the city on the banks of the Arno River, thanks to the manufacturing activity of wool processing. The original position of the painting inside the church is unknown, but it is possible that it was hung over a side altar, or on a partition dividing the secular space from the choir of the Humiliati monks, who officiated in the church. Giotto continued to work for this church during his career, painting at least two more works. The great panel can be considered one of the greatest achievements of medieval wooden carpentry. The painter Cennino Cennini teaches how to choose the wood, join the panels together, sand the wood and putty it, cover over the joins with strips of linen cloth. And how to prepare the panel for painting, by creating a ground layer, made up of seven or eight coats of gesso and glue. Great importance is given to the preparatory drawing, executed with charcoal and reinforced with ink. In the latter, gold foil, a very thin leaf made by the gold beater, was applied over a ground of red bowl and then polished or burnished with an animal tooth. At this point, the colouring in of the wood panel was started. Now observe the Virgin. a woman of powerful appearance. Her blonde hair escaping from beneath the veil. She is holding the child on her lap, as any mother would do. The blessing child on the mother's knees, though in his childlike physiognomy, seems to relate to the worshipper as an adult figure, holding in his left hand a scroll, the so-called chirograph, a symbol of the debt of original sin, that he came to redeem with grace.
For the first time, the colors of the clothing are not flat and uniform. The shape of the body beneath the cloth is made visible through contrasts of light. Chiaroscuro. The parts in relief are lighter, whereas the internal folds are darker. Observe the throne. The painter attempts to convey depth. That's why the sides are in perspective and why we can see the faces of two severe prophets through its apertures. Thanks to this expedient, we realize that there is space and air behind the throne, in spite of the flat golden background. Even the steps solidly rest on the ground, the entire structure is stable and realistically holds the Madonna and Christ Child. The throne on which the Virgin is seated is a symbolic representation of the heavenly Jerusalem of which she is queen. It is God himself who has chosen her. In her, as in the temple in Jerusalem, he has placed his seat. This is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. In central Italy, the large Meisters present the theme of the Virgin Odigetria, who holds the solemnly composed child on her left knee, while blessing with her outstretched right hand, and clutching a scroll with her left hand. Giotto conforms to the dominant theme, in order to update it stylistically. It is necessary to consider that when we speak of enthroned Meister, the Meister is the Divine One, in the person of the Child Jesus, and the Throne is the Virgin holding Him, who is therefore invoked with the appellation, Throne of Wisdom. Cimabue and Duccio in his wake had elaborated on the trellisized arrangement of the wooden throne, fattened by fixed carvings and gilded fillets. With Giotto burst into Florence the novelty of the marble throne, finely inlaid in Opus Romanum. The throne, a true cusped architecture, inlaid with polychrome marble and decorated with medieval ornaments, harks back to the Cosmetean experience and coeval Gothic architecture. Giotto in his painting also proves to be a capable architect. The throne is reminiscent of medieval architecture, 
a church or a ciborium of the florid Gothic period. A church, because the Virgin Mary is mother, as is the mother church. A ciborium, the heart of the Gothic building, as Christ, by the giving of his own body, redeems humankind from original sin. The throne, which simulates architectural three-dimensionality, gives depth to the altarpiece, as in the throne of God the Blessing Father in the Scroveni Chapel. In both cases Giotto establishes an inseparable link with the Gothic architecture of the time. In its vertical momentum, in its lightness, in its decorative details, in the play between solids and voids, in the trefoil arms, in the spires. A veritable multitude of angels, arranged in symmetrical order, stands next to the prophets. Notice how the angels in the back are partially hidden from view from those in the front. It is one of the rules of perspective, but what today seems obvious was in those days a great leap forward, and was achieved by Giotto through the careful observation of reality. The adoring angels, depicted in profile, have a dual function. In the composition they sustain a careful, concentrated gaze, almost in a radial, geometric convergence that has its center in the face of the Virgin. In their symmetry, as is traditional for enthroned Meisters, they testify to compositional perfection, a reference to the perfection of the painted subject. This symmetry is also meant to exalt equally the dual kingships represented, that of Jesus and that of his mother. The classicism of the angels is one of the most striking notes of the altarpiece. The ideal proportions. The harmonious, controlled posture. The sculptural folds of the robes introduce a new era of painting. The folds of the robes accord the figures of the angels to the vertical rhythms of the altarpiece and to the naturalism expressed by these figures. One of the angels dressed in green, the color of the theological virtue of hope, bears the gift of a crown, a symbol of the kingship of Mary and her son. The other reaffirms that virtue with the gift of the Pyxis, containing the consecrated body of Christ, as hope for the salvation of humanity. Those kneeling are clothed in white, the color of faith. The dogma proclaimed by the Council of Ephesus in 451 regarding divine motherhood is thus confirmed. The angel on the right offers a vase of roses and lilies. 
flowers symbolizing the Virgin, a breath of spring and one of the first still lifes in medieval art. Giotto paints here a splendid still life insert, one of the earliest examples in art. The large white roses, the Marian roses of faith, are accompanied by the traditional red roses, the symbol, from Venus onward, of earthly love. And if the former symbolize Mary's innocence and virginity, the red ones indicate the Virgin's passionate love for all humanity. And red is also the Rose of Christ, a sign of the bloodshed for the salvation of humankind. The lilies reiterate, in this splendid and dual piece of still life and hortus conclusus, the purity of the Virgin. The color red, a symbol of charity, is also expressed by the flap of the robe that guards the child. Evoking the maternal embrace, it also evokes the shape of the heart. The characteristics of the revolution brought about by Giotto are present in this imposing Maya star. The representation of space, depth and volume. A return to the realism typical of ancient art, away from the rigid frontal views of the Byzantine style. And the beginnings of an autonomous Western art. This revolution could only have arisen in Florence. The city was at that time in full economic development, and its pure gold florin was the currency that dictated prices throughout Europe. All this wealth stemmed from a new social class, the commercial bourgeoisie. It was sought and obtained through work, entrepreneurial talent, and direct contact with day-to-day -day reality. The new style originated from this new social class. It was as real, concrete, and realistic as the society it originated from, to which Giotto belonged, and of which he was a brilliant interpreter. The Meister was executed when Giotto had already achieved great fame and was a painter in demand by patrons throughout Italy. So human and at the same time so divine, it stands out not only for the naturalism with which he revolutionized the subject, but also for the perfect balance between tradition and innovation. The new artistic level achieved by Giotto with this Meister will represent for a long time a model of inspiration for artists. A point of arrival for his contemporaries and a starting point for those of the following century who with Masaccio will initiate a new course in art traversable also thanks to Giotto's unparalleled mastery.